Yeah, thank you, Jamie, for that kind introduction. I hope I, I, hope I don't disappoint. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to join this panel. I told Luis when he invited me that I was actually mainly interested in joining the session to learn about the amazing work that he and others at KEI have been doing but beyond what I hear in the news. And uh, I'll say I, 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 this hasn't disappointed. So I actually don't have a ton original to add beyond one additional idea for uh, identifying the government role going forward. And honestly, I think this idea may or may not work. And I wanted to introduce it now and bounce it off people who are more knowledgeable about, about these topics than, than am I. Um, and let's see how knowledgeable I am about advancing my slides. Okay, so um, before diving into the idea, let me summarize from my perspective at a very high level what it is, and this is pre-COVID, uh, what it is I think we know and, and the many things that we don't know on this topic of the role of the government in, in pharmaceutical innovation and drug development. From my sense, and this is from some of my work, but also Aaron Kesselheim, um, Cleary, a bunch of people over, over the years, over 10, 20, 30 years, that from both the qualitative, from the perspective of both qualitative and quantitative evidence, I think we know that for the vast majority of important drugs, maybe 70 to 100%, there are linkages or traces between government funded research and, and the drug innovation. So through publications, through patent citations, qualitative research and whatnot. For about a fifth to a quarter of important drugs, and we could talk about what that means, but just take my word for it now, uh, we see, and I'm talking about small molecule drugs, so that's an important distinction. We see at least one patent with government interests. And again, there's there's two or three or four or ten different papers that kind of that kind of suggest that. So that's my one thing, one set of things that I think we know. A second set of things I think we know are about the division of labor between the public and private sectors. Uh, in general, in quote unquote normal times the government role, and I'm thinking here mostly about the NIH, is, is mostly upstream on so-called basic research. Um, in most cases, even for the 20 or 25% of drugs where we do see government rights in the drug, the firms are still typically, not always, paying for the trials. So we need to think about their incentives um, as, as well. Two notes to this, and, and this will transition to what I'm getting to next. First, it doesn't need to be that way. I have argued for some time that the government could avoid some of these trade-offs um, just by going more downstream into drug development. And, um, um, and we can talk about that. But second, it doesn't, it's not always that way, including in crises. So I've done some work on World War II, but it seems, and we saw this from previous presentations today, also now, the government's certainly not funding, it's actually not funding much at all basic research now, though it's previous quote unquote basic research is in the background, especially on, on mRNA and things like that. But right now it's actually quite involved downstream in development trials, manufacturing, purchase agreements and things like that. And you would expect uh, the government, to the extent the government has a role there, you would expect uh, the argument that it should be able to use that role to affect prices, access and other outcomes to be, to be much stronger in this context than in normal times. A few other things where we don't know. Um, actually, why don't I not go through all of these for purposes of time, but just focus on the last one because it touches on some of the things that uh, were discussed in previous presentations. This question that Luis raised about underreporting. How would estimates of this direct role, which again, I've pinned at 20 to 25% of drugs, how would that change if we actually had accurate reporting of, of government grants and contracts in patents? And are there important drugs in general or in the COVID context where the government actually has rights, but we're not seeing them because of, because of underreporting? There's various ways in which you can think about solving this problem. We've talked about some of them. I, I think uh, Luis's work on certificates of correction, um, and I know Jamie's been doing some of that, is, is really promising. Um, Two approaches that have been used, and we've heard some of them just now, are qualitative assessment of the grants and contracts out there that seem to be in the same technological space and have the same individuals or firms involved, um, though that's harder to do if, if for Catherine's presentation, we can't actually see the contracts. But um, that's one way to do so, which is to look at government funding in that area 
um, around the time uh, to, to the firms or inventors involved around the time a patent was developed. A second would be a qualitative assessment of publications that occur around the same time with inventor overlap using funding using the funding acknowledgements data that are reported in, in publications, but not always in patents. And so my idea, my, my modest proposal here that I wanted to put out there is to take advantage of what we uh, empirical, in the empirical economics community we call, it's kind of a clunky term, patent paper pairs, uh, knowledge that's disclosed both in the form of scientific publications, but also in patents. Um, and we see that happen quite a bit, especially in biotech, especially for, for academic research. We can often, when we find a patent, find a twin publication. Um, and the key here is that even if the patents don't report government funding, we can use the publication uh, and information on who funded the publication to sort of back that out. Now, this has been done in a number of examples that we just saw in a lot of um, work. Um, so some of the work R.T. Rai and I did years ago, I know KEI has probably gone down this path as well. So this has been done on a case-by-case -case basis. The idea I have is to try to scale it up using, for lack of a better term, modern data science techniques. So you could take a set of patents, say the whole Orange Book or all of Moderna's patents or all mRNA patents or whatever, find and, and essentially use the patent paper pair algorithm to identify corresponding papers in PubMed, which is the public database of, uh, of, of, of the biomedical literature. So you find, one version of the algorithm is you find publications in PubMed that have the same authors, typically two to three author overlap works well. You filter by time, so you don't want patents that are too far away from the publication. Um, and then, and here's the, the more interesting part, you can compute measures of textual similarity using the title and the abstract. So instead of doing this qualitatively, you can use modern natural language processing techniques to do so. And in this context, unlike many others, you can actually benchmark the performance of this algorithm against known patent paper pairs. So cases where they do report, we can, where they do report, we can see like what the level of similarity is, what I call alpha here, um, and then look for things that, that aren't reported uh, that are above that cutoff alpha. And I think those are the things where you'd wanna see further investigation. So there's a lot of advantages of this. I'll talk about disadvantages in a second. One advantage is you could do this at scale. So, you know, if you had, some resources or more importantly, time and, and skill, you could do this for all, pat all biomedical patents in some sense, or all of PubMed actually. And moreover, you can also do this proactively with patent applications. There's no reason you need a patent grant, which is, might be particularly important in, in this context. Um, I haven't said anything about COVID, but here's a paper that um, Fred Ledley and his team at Bentley did. Um, it's actually a, a preprint that is tracing PubMed publications on the vaccine technologies that are involved in warp speed. And you'll see this, the second column that I've, that I've circled here that, you know, something from 15 to 30% of PubMed publications on these technologies have NIH funding. Well, one natural thing to do if you think my approach would work is to find the corresponding patents. So use the pairs algorithm to find the corresponding patents, figure out who owns them um, and, and whatnot. Okay, so that's basically all I have. It's, it's uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll make a, a, a patent law joke. It's neither not, not novel nor non-obvious, but, but perhaps is, is useful. And I wanted to get other people's thoughts on um, both the feasibility and desirability of trying to do something like this, but also um, if someone wants to help, I'd be, I'd be very happy to collaborate on this. Thanks.